December 14th, 1825. The revolt was over, but the emperor's eldest son, Grand Duke Alexander, was still trembling with fear. The boy knew his father had gone out to do his duty and might have been killed for it. Then he heard his father's voice calling him to come outside. Loyal troops were formed up in the courtyard. Just an hour earlier, they had refused the rebels' entry to the palace. The emperor took his son in his arms and addressed the men. I don't need protection, but I entrust him to you, and handed Alexander over to them. The soldiers cheered with tears in their eyes. The young prince was carried aloft in their arms. Nobody suspected that one day, this future emperor would face far greater dangers of his own. Nicholas was a huge baby, the size of a three-month-old, it was said. His grandmother, Catherine the Great, wrote in admiration, I've never seen such a cavalier. If he continues to grow, this colossus will dwarf his brothers. Chapter 1. Nicholas I Pavlovich When Nicholas was five, his father, the Emperor Paul, was brutally murdered by conspirators. The children remembered it well. The youngest brother, Michael, was playing on his own. He built a train of tiny carriages and used it to carry a toy soldier to a potted plant, then buried him in the earth. When asked what he was doing, he answered, I'm burying my father. After Paul's death in 1801, his eldest son, the 24-year-old Alexander, became emperor. The second brother, Constantine, became the new heir to the throne. As the third brother, Nicholas wasn't expected to inherit the throne. He grew up under the strict care of his mother, Maria, the dowager empress. At the age of 17, Nicholas and his younger brother, Michael, were allowed to travel abroad. Years later, he recalled, that's when we started to live, stepping from childhood into the light of life. It was in Berlin that I saw, for the first time, the girl I wanted to spend the rest of my life with. The 16-year-old Princess Charlotte of Prussia, daughter of the king, was an ideal match for the Grand Duke. They were married two years later, and Charlotte took the Russian name Alexandra Fyodorovna. Grand Duke Nicholas was later appointed Chief Inspector of the Corps of Engineers and Commander of the Guards Engineer Battalion. Every day he rose early for prayer and morning exercise, performing complex bayonet drill with a musket. The rest of the day was spent writing orders and reports and carrying out inspections. Nicholas's elder brother, Emperor Alexander I, often hinted that he planned to leave the throne to Nicholas, since their middle brother, Constantine, had no interest in becoming emperor. And so, in 1823, Alexander signed a secret will, making Nicholas his heir. Only four people knew of its existence. Nicholas was not one of them. On November 19, 1825, Alexander died suddenly in the southern city of Taganrog. Eight days later, the news reached St. Petersburg. Nicholas swore allegiance to his older brother, Constantine, the presumed heir, who was in Warsaw. Then, Alexander's secret will was proclaimed, and two weeks later, Constantine's renunciation of the throne arrived from Poland. <laughs> 
It was a unique case in world history. Instead of quarreling for the throne, two Romanov brothers were insisting it belonged to the other. Cad Langeron later paid them a subtle French compliment. The Romanovs are so noble, they do not ascend, but descend to the throne. But the resulting confusion was dangerous and encouraged a secret radical society, the Decembrists, to make their move. The Decembrists were made up of liberal-minded guards officers and nobles who wished to reform the monarchy and free Russia's serfs. Its members included many high-ranking aristocrats. Members of its northern society, led by Nikita Muravyev, favored a constitutional monarchy, while members of the southern society, under Pavel Pestel, wanted to abolish the monarch and redistribute the land. They planned to carry out a military coup d'etat. The more radical conspirators, Rieliev and Pestel, talked of killing the entire Romanov family, including the princesses living abroad and their children, so no one could ever lay claim to the Russian throne again. The troops were due to swear their oaths of loyalty to the new emperor on December 14th. The evening before, Nicholas visited Mikolovsky Castle, where his father had been murdered. When he returned, he asked his wife to die with honor, if need be. At 11.20, Nicholas was told the Moscow Guards Regiment had refused to swear the oath and had marched to Senate Square. At 11.30, the emperor went to the square with the loyal palace guards. At 12.20, General Miloradovich tried to talk to the rebel troops, but was shot dead by a Decembrist. At 1 p.m., 900 rebel guardsmen approached the Winter Palace. 1.20 p.m., Nicholas sent a bishop to reason with the soldiers, but nobody listened to him. By 2 p.m., there were 3,000 rebel troops in the square. Loyal troops were arriving all the time, but Nicholas continued to delay. At 10 past four, cannon opened fire on the rebels. The young Empress Alexandra could see the Senate Square filled with people. At the sound of the first volley, she wrote, I fell to my knees in a small study and prayed like never before. The strain of that day affected Alexandra for the rest of her life. Her health suffered. Already thin, she lost more weight and became frequently ill. The emperor ordered the first blast of grape shot to be fired over the heads of the rebel soldiers. But the next volley was fired straight into the crowd. When the smoke cleared, the death toll stood at one general, 18 officers, 282 soldiers, and 1,170 civilians, including 79 women and 150 children a total of 1,271 dead. Six hundred and seventy-nine people were investigated following the Decembrist revolt but most turned out to have no connection to the secret societies that had organized the coup. Of those finally put on trial, 112 lost their titles and all of their property rights. 99 were exiled to Siberia, 36 of those to labor camps, nine officers were demoted to the ranks, 36 were sentenced to death, 31 by beheading, and five by quartering. Emperor Nicholas himself mitigated many of the sentences, and in the end, only five Decembrists were executed. They included ringleaders such as Pestel and the poet Rieliev, and the man who'd shot General Mir Loradovich. Quartering was commuted to hanging. <laughs>
the emperor himself paid an allowance to the widows of the executed men. Their families continued to receive payments from the office of the general staff for 20 years, while the children were put through school at public expense. Nicholas ordered the Decembrist grievances to be looked at by a special committee. He invited Count Kiselyov, a Decembrist sympathizer and opponent of serfdom, to look into its abolition. While receiving a delegation of nobles from Smolensk, the emperor told them plainly, I cannot understand how a person became a thing. I cannot explain it other than through guile and deceit on one side and ignorance on the other. During Nicholas's reign, new restrictions were imposed on the owners of serfs. Landowners could no longer sentence serfs to hard labor or sell them off without land. Serfs were granted more freedom of movement and the right to conduct their own business. The percentage of Russians living as privately owned serfs fell from 57% to 35%. The number of schools for peasants rose from 60 to 2,550. Nicholas was trained as an engineer and fascinated by new inventions. In 1835, he was seduced by a project many thought was crazy. At that time, there were only three railroads in the world, two in England and one in America. Nicholas studied the schemes on offer carefully and authorized construction of an experimental railroad between St. Petersburg and his palace at Zaskia Selo. Four years later, ignoring the objections of ministers, he ordered another line built, connecting St. Petersburg and Moscow. At the time, it was the longest railroad in the world, at 649.7 kilometers. Its construction cost 67 million rubles, one third of the empire's annual budget. All 34 stations and both terminals were designed by one architect, Konstantin Ton, who was also responsible for the Grand Kremlin Palace. The rails were 1,524 millimeters apart, 89 millimeters wider than in Europe. It was believed the emperor insisted on this difference so an invading army couldn't use its own rolling stock on Russian railways. 100 years later, during World War II, those 89 millimeters would prove crucial in slowing down the advance and resupply of German troops during the battle for Moscow. During Nicholas's reign, 700 miles of rail track were laid across Russia. It was not much, but Russia's first railways did help to stimulate Russian industrial output, which grew 30-fold in just three decades. Russia's first hardened roads were built, connecting Moscow and St. Petersburg, Moscow and Irkutsk, and Moscow and Warsaw. These developments, overseen by Russia's engineer emperor, began a much-needed modernization of the country's transport network. The emperor began his working day at 7 a.m. Around 11, he'd take a walk along the palace embankment without guards, greeting those he knew. He then returned to work until around 8 p.m., when he would go out to the theater or perhaps a ball. He returned home at midnight and worked until 3 a.m. By today's standards, his personal security was non-existent. No one saw the need. The emperor didn't eat much, and when he did, preferred simple food. He loved veal cutlets with mashed potato, but often had just a slice of black bread or a salted cucumber for dinner. On the road, his meals were even simpler, porridge and some cabbage soup, which he'd eat from the same bowl. He drank mineral water from Salzburg, and very rarely, wines from Bordeaux. He never smoked. They said that those of a nervous disposition found it difficult to meet the emperor's gaze, while ladies were known to faint in his presence. <laughs> 
not from fear, but from adoration. Nicholas, six foot two, broad-shouldered and well-built, was considered one of the most handsome men in Europe. It was rumored at court that Nicholas wore padding underneath his uniform to look more imposing. But his private doctor said this was not true. The emperor simply had a very broad chest. In public, he did not relax for an instant. His appearance was immaculate at all times. It's no surprise that Nicholas I became the role model for all future Romanovs. The emperor brought a sense of calm and stability to Russia in an uncertain age. Contemporary newspapers depicted France as an exploding bottle of champagne, while Russia was a bottle of vodka without a bubble in sight. It was a reference to the explosive revolutions sweeping across Europe in the 1840s. Only Britain, the Netherlands and Russia escaped unrest. Nicholas's 30-year reign was the most stable period in the history of Tsarist Russia. Nicholas devoted himself to matters of state. No important document crossed his desk without some comment from him. His own office, the Imperial Chancellery, became the hub of government. The first section of the Chancellery was responsible for preparing Imperial decrees and monitoring their implementation. The second section worked on the codification of Russia's laws into a single text. The third section was in charge of police surveillance, censorship, tracing counterfeiters and investigating serf complaints against landowners. The fourth section, or the office of the Empress Maria, worked on charitable projects, including shelters, hospitals and women's education. The fifth section worked on reforms of the serf system. The notorious third section of the Imperial Chancellery effectively served as the Tsar's secret police. Its mission was to gauge the political mood for him and to expose any conspiracies against the regime. It had a permanent staff, however, of just 36. It was led by a hero of the Napoleonic Wars and close friend of the Emperor, Count Alexander von Benkendorf. He also headed the Special Corps of Gendarmes, who served as a uniformed security police with a strength of 4,000. The prestige and authority of the corps was very high. It's no coincidence that a gendarme appears in the famous final scene of Gogol's play, The Government Inspector. Gogol's satire only avoided being banned thanks to the emperor's personal intervention. Though remembered as a great reactionary, Nicholas saw no harm in such an amusing play. One of Nicholas's first acts after his coronation was to end the exile of the great Russian poet Alexander Pushkin. The emperor even exempted Pushkin from the normal channels of censorship, promising to vet his works personally. Pushkin dedicated nine poems to Nicholas, while the emperor intervened on a number of occasions to get Pushkin out of trouble, even paying off his debts worth the equivalent of several million dollars. In 1837, another great Russian poet, Mikhail Lyamantov, was transferred from his Guard Hussars regiment to a unit fighting in the far south in Russia's endless Caucasian war. The conflict had begun 20 years earlier, in 1817, when the Russian army invaded the Northern Caucasus during the reign of Alexander I. The war ebbed and flowed until reaching a new crescendo in the 1830s, when Imam Shamil led Chechen and Dagestani warriors in a jihad against the Russian invader. The fighting dragged on for another 30 years until Russia was finally able to impose its rule on the Northern Caucasus. By the 1850s, a European coalition was forming against Russia, alarmed by the expansionist foreign policy of the Russian Empire. Under Nicholas, Russia had won wars against both the Persian and Ottoman empires 
and its growing influence in the Eastern Mediterranean and Central Asia was seen as a threat to British and French imperial interests. In 1853, fighting broke out around the Black Sea, leading to what became known as the Crimean War. Russian troops clashed with Turkish troops in the Balkans and Caucasus, while the Black Sea fleet annihilated a Turkish squadron at the Battle of Sinop. Days later, British and French warships appeared in the Black Sea. By 1854, Russia was at war with Britain, France, Turkey and Sardinia. Austria and Prussia remained neutral. Nicholas was profoundly depressed that Russia was not only isolated, but at war with its former allies. The fighting raged on many fronts, from Crimea and the Caucasus in the south to the White Sea in the north. Here, a British naval expedition was repulsed, but in the Baltic, the British naval blockade crippled Russian trade. In the Caucasus, Russian troops were victorious, but in Crimea, the main theater of war, a disaster unfolded. Russian forces besieged at Sevastopol faced a powerful enemy. Steam-driven warships made up 30% of the Russian fleet, but 70% of the Allied fleet. Admiral Nakimov was forced to sink his own ships in the entrance to Sevastopol harbor. It was the only way to keep out the more powerful British and French warships. More than 127,000 Russians were killed in the siege of Sevastopol. The total death toll of the Russian army was about 143,000. The Crimean War was a catastrophe for Russia. Russian soldiers and sailors fought with incredible bravery. But in the end, the industrialized might of France and Britain proved too strong. In September 1855, Sevastopol fell, and the Black Sea Fleet was no more. Nicholas was crushed. He couldn't sleep and wore himself out with work. Doctors told him he needed rest, but he didn't listen. In a private conversation, the emperor said, if it was up to me, I would never have chosen this position for myself. But it's my watch. I have my orders and must fulfill them as best I can. At the end of January, the emperor caught a chill. His doctor forbade him from going out in the cold, but Nicholas insisted on attending a parade for troops leaving for the front. He told his doctor, you've done your duty, now let me do mine. It was soon evident the emperor had contracted pneumonia. On February 17th, his lungs began to give up. The emperor was fully conscious and knew he had hours to live. He said his prayers and then bid farewell to his family. When told a courier had arrived from Crimea with urgent news, he pointed to his son and said, this is not for me, this is for him. Then he said to Prince Alexander, I hand over command though I do not leave things in the state I would have wished. On February 18th, 1855, a banner of mourning rose above the Winter Palace. Nicholas I was dead. His successor was his 37-year-old son, Alexander, a man destined to achieve what his great-grandmother, Catherine the Great, his uncle Alexander I, and his father, Nicholas, could not. Alexander II would go down in history as the Liberator. Chapter 2, Alexander II Nikolaevich. His father used to say, I want to bring my son up as a man first, and then an emperor. The prince's tutors, such as the romantic poet Vasily Zhukovsky, were all men with liberal views. <laughs> 
When Alexander was 13, his father interrupted a lesson to speak to him about the Decembrist revolt. What would you do if you were me? The emperor asked. I'd forgive them, Alexander said. After finishing his studies, the prince traveled across Russia, covering 30,000 kilometers and visiting 30 provinces. He was the first Romanov to cross the border of Europe and Asia and to visit Siberia. In Tobolsk, the prince met the exiled Decembrists and did what he could to make their life easier. In Vyatka, he met another exile, Alexander Herzen. The two young men became friends and Alexander helped hasten the young writer's eventual return to Moscow. Herzen later praised the reforming emperor. Alexander II did many things, a great many things. His name stands above that of all his predecessors. He fought for the rights of man. Neither the Russian people nor history will forget that. In 1852, Herzen moved to London, from where he agitated for sweeping social change in his homeland. First and foremost, he demanded the abolition of serfdom. When he was still a young prince, Alexander's father had often accused him of listening more to his heart than to his mind. He certainly had many unregal qualities. He was carefree, gentle, and sensitive. What's more, the gallant, handsome young prince, heir to the Russian throne, was constantly falling in love with palace chambermaids. In 1838, the 20-year-old Alexander was sent to Europe by his parents to find an eligible young princess to marry. In Darmstadt, he became devoted to a shy and pretty 14-year-old, Princess Maximiliana Wilhelmina Maria of Hesse. Later in London, Alexander was presented to the newly crowned Queen Victoria, ruler of the British Empire. They met at Windsor Castle on her 20th birthday. In her diary, Victoria described Alexander as a dear, delightful man with a sweet smile and a manly figure. They danced together until the small hours of the morning. He is so very strong, she wrote, that in running around, you must follow quickly. And after that, you are whisked around, which is very pleasant. I have never enjoyed myself more. Alexander was infatuated and prepared to renounce the Russian throne to become the British Prince Consort. His courtiers were forced to intervene talking sense into the young prince and reminding him of his duty to Russia, not to mention the young princess of Hesse. That union was approved by all, so the couple were married in St. Petersburg in 1841. His new wife took the Russian name Maria Alexandrovna. For the first few years, Alexander was wildly in love with his young wife and spoiled her continuously. He even had an apple tree brought into the dining room, so Maria could pick its fruit herself as she liked. But it did not last long. They spent less and less time together, and when they met, they discussed only their health, their children, and the weather. They appeared together in public for official functions and visits, then went to separate bedrooms in the evening. The Empress's health suffered from St. Petersburg's cold, wet climate, as well as from frequent childbirth. By 36, she'd had six children and was a shadow of her former self. The Emperor had many short-lived affairs, with ladies-in-waiting, chambermaids, even older students from the nearby Smolny Institute of Noble Maidens. But Alexander was forgiven everything because everyone loved him. The country was alive with expectation 
he was Russia's great hope. When Alexander became emperor, he already had many years' experience of the workings of state and got to work immediately. His first success was to end the Crimean War, signing a peace treaty in Paris which kept Russian losses to a minimum. Then he turned his attention to what was, for Russia, the great issue of the age, the serfs. In one of his first addresses to the Russian nobility, the emperor announced, the existing system of owning souls cannot remain unchanged. It is better to abolish serfdom from above than to wait for it to abolish itself from below. Until now, Russia's rulers hadn't dared to interfere with serfdom for fear of a revolt by the nobles. But for Alexander, there was no longer any alternative. The case for reform, moral, economic and political, was irresistible. After seven years of negotiation, on February 19, 1861, the emperor issued a manifesto freeing Russia's serfs. The act of emancipation freed all serfs in private ownership and gave them the right to buy the land they worked on from the landowner. The state helped peasants pay for the land with subsidies and long-term loans. Peasants were to pay 20% of its value and the state 80%. However, in some cases, only 30% of the land they'd previously worked was eligible for purchase, and it was sold at inflated prices. State loans also trapped many peasants in debt for decades. Following the emancipation of the serfs, the 100 million peasants in Russia, who made up 71% of the population, owned half as much land as the 1.7 million nobles, who made up just 1.5% of the population. A wave of liberal reforms followed. In 1864, each district and province was granted its own elected assembly, known as Zemstva with authority over local education, roads, medical services, and social welfare. Education reform increased the number of state secondary schools and universities, with more schools for the poor, the first general education courses for women, and the granting of special status and greater autonomy for universities. Reform of the courts introduced greater equality for all classes before the law, as well as public trials, counsel for defense and prosecution, and juries. In the army, universal conscription replaced the old quota system, and modern weapons such as rifles were introduced. They were the most progressive and liberal reforms in Russia's history. When an old courtier warned that now the serfs were free, the people would demand a constitution, Alexander replied, well, if Russia clearly desires it and is ready for it, I too am ready. Alexander set strict deadlines for his ministers and advisers, which he kept to himself despite the huge piles of documents that arrived on his desk every day. His goal was to finish all the work begun by his father, which meant turning next to the war in the Caucasus. The long Caucasian war finally came to an end in 1864, following the Russian conquest of Chechnya, Dagestan, Chikassia, and Abkhazia. In the next decade, Russia also took control of the Emirate of Bukhara and Khanate of Kiva, pushing south as far as the town of Kushka, which remained the empire's most southerly point until the collapse of the Soviet Union. The only territory lost in this period was Alaska, 1.5 million square kilometers of barren, almost uninhabited land which in 1867 
was sold to the United States for $7.2 million, worth around $108 million today. At the time, the deal was considered very profitable. Typically, Alexander worked with short breaks from 9 a.m. until 6 in the evening when he had dinner. He spent his evenings with his family or at official functions. His favorite sport was hunting. He loved long hunting expeditions for bear, elk, and bison. But soon it was Alexander who was being hunted through the very streets of the Russian capital. Alexander was the last ruler in Russian history who would be allowed to simply walk the city streets without guards. Almost every day in St. Petersburg's summer garden, the regulars pretended not to recognize the tall gentleman in military uniform, whose portrait hung in every government office in the empire. Alexander was now 48 and had lost count of the number of affairs he'd had. At first, his relationship with 19-year-old Catherine Dolgorukova, a student from the Smolny Institute for Young Maidens, seemed like many of the others. But after just a few meetings, the emperor was in love. Many years later, Catherine remembered how Alexander always behaved so tenderly towards her, treating her as though she were a sacred object. We saw each other every day, she wrote, crazy with the joy of loving and understanding each other so completely. He swore to me that he would always be faithful to me and that his only dream was to marry me if he ever became free. On April 4, 1866, after meeting with Catherine, Alexander was leaving the summer garden when an assassin stepped out. The emperor, of course, knew his enemies might try to overthrow or even murder him. An old fortune teller had once told him that there would be seven attempts on his life. Alexander always remembered it. The first attempt was made by a 26-year-old lone assassin named Dmitry Karakosov, an impoverished nobleman and former student. He believed the emperor's death would inspire the people to rise up in revolution. He was thwarted by a farmer standing next to him named Komisarov, who grabbed his hand at the last moment and forced him to fire high. Karakozov was arrested. He said he tried to kill the Tsar because his reforms had cheated the people by giving them too little land. The entire country was shocked. In 1863, the great historian Sergei Solovyov described the situation Russia faced. Extremes are easy. It was easy to tighten the screws in Nicholas's time. It was easy to unscrew them in Alexander's time. But it's exceptionally difficult to slow down the carriage on a steep hill. A reformer like Peter the Great held the reins in an iron grip and the carriage was safe. A reformer like Alexander II lets the horses run full speed down the hill without the strength to restrain them. So the whole carriage is threatened with destruction. Alexander's private life, meanwhile, was a growing distraction. His affair with Catherine, nearly 30 years his junior, was alienating close friends and family. Catherine was forced to go abroad for a while. But Alexander soon traveled to France under the pretext of visiting the World Fair to be with her. They walked the Grand Boulevards of Paris hand in hand. 
Alexander wrote to Catherine, I am madly in love with you. These wonderful days we spend together make me infinitely happy. The lovers did not know they were being constantly watched by agents of the French secret police. But they couldn't keep him safe. A Polish nationalist, Anton Berezovsky, made the second attempt on Alexander's life. He shot at Alexander as he was riding in an open carriage with the French Emperor Napoleon III. But the bullet hit the horse. Alexander became accustomed to constant danger. When Russia went to war once more with Turkey, he went to visit troops at the front and came under fire several times. The war was triggered by the Muslim Turks' brutal treatment of Orthodox Bulgarians. Russia now intended to liberate Bulgaria from the Turkish yoke. The war ended in complete victory for Russia. Bulgaria became an independent state, and the name Alexander II Tsar Liberator is still commemorated during each service in every Bulgarian church. On April 2nd, 1879, as the emperor was returning from his morning walk, he was greeted by a passerby. Alexander replied absent-mindedly, then noticed the passerby was holding a gun. 60-year-old Alexander, emperor of Russia, king of Poland, grand duke of Finland, made a zigzag run for his life. This third attempt was made by a 33-year-old ex-student, Alexander Salaviev, a member of the secret revolutionary society Land and Freedom. He was also working alone. After giving chase to the emperor, he fired several times from a range of 10 yards and missed. A new left-wing terrorist group, the People's Will, soon emerged. Its leaders, Sofia Perovskia and Andrei Zhelyabov, began planning a less amateurish attempt on the Tsar's life. The fourth attempt was made in November 1879. Zhelyabov's group planted a mine with an electric detonator under the railway track as the emperor traveled to the town of Alexandrovsk. But the mine failed to explode. The fifth attempt was made by Perovsky's group. They planted another mine under the railway tracks outside Moscow. But the Tsar's train left early, and the terrorists blew up the wrong train. On May 22, 1880, Empress Maria died. After just 40 days mourning, Alexander married Catherine Dalgarukova who took the title Princess Yurievskia. The wedding took place in secret in a small room at the palace of Zaskia Selo, because both the Tsar's family and public opinion opposed the marriage. The emperor was now guarded more closely than ever, but still was not safe. The sixth attempt was made by Stepan Kalturin, a member of the People's Will, who'd been hired as a carpenter at the Winter Palace. Over six months, he smuggled 30 kilos of dynamite into a cellar under the Tsar's dining room. The resulting explosion killed 11 people and wounded 56, all of them staff. The emperor had left the dining room to meet a late guest. The emperor wrote to his son, asking that if the worst should happen, he must care for his wife and young children. On his windowsill, Alexander began to find dead pigeons torn to shreds. It turned out a kite had made its home on the palace roof. It was caught 
The bird was so incredibly large, it was sent to the Cabinet of Curiosities. The hunted emperor, exhausted and sick, dreamt of only one thing, to abdicate in favor of his eldest son and leave for Nice with his wife and children. But one important task remained. He had ordered work to begin on the introduction of an elected assembly. It was to be Russia's first step towards a parliament and constitution. Alexander had already approved it. On March 4, 1881, it was to be put before the ministerial cabinet and then announced to the public. On March 1st, the emperor traveled to the Mikolovsky Manege to see the trooping of the color. On his way back, he visited his sister, Grand Duchess Catherine, at Mikolovsky Castle. They drank tea and talked about his plans to leave for Nice. At 2.10 p.m., the emperor left in his carriage. He had to be at the Winter Palace by 3 o'clock, as he promised to take a walk with his wife. The emperor's carriage turned onto the embankment along the Catherine Canal. Six Cossacks accompanied the carriage, three on either side. Officers of the guard, including the chief of police, followed in two sledges. A boy carrying a bread basket was running along the pavement. Alexander saw a woman make a signal with a white handkerchief. When a man with a packet in his hands appeared before the carriage, he realized there would be an explosion. The seventh attempt on Alexander's life was made by Nicholas Rusikov, a 20-year-old student and member of the People's Will. It was Sofia Perovskia who had given the signal. Rusikov threw a handmade bomb at the carriage. The blast killed two Cossacks and a passing boy, injured three horses, and shattered the Emperor's bulletproof coach. But the Emperor was unharmed. Rusikov was quickly apprehended. The chief of police rushed up to Alexander. The Emperor remained calm. I offered him my sledge to go back to the palace. All right, he said, but show me the criminal first. Everyone begged the emperor to leave, but he insisted on seeing Rusikov. Alexander looked his would-be assassin in the eyes. He had survived the seventh attempt. Everything was behind him now but innocent people had been hurt because of him. Alexander wanted to see the wounded. The chief of police followed. After we'd taken no more than three steps, I was deafened by a second explosion. Amid the smoke and fog, I heard His Highness's weak voice cry, help. I tried to lift him, but saw that His Highness's legs were completely shattered. The second bomber was 25-year-old Ignaty Grinovitsky, who blew himself up along with the Emperor. Alexander's last words were, hurry home, I want to die in the palace. Alexander died an hour later in his study at the Winter Palace. Grand Duke Alexander, the Emperor's nephew, wrote, a huge crowd gathered outside the Winter Palace. Nobody spoke. Wide, dark bloodstains left a trail up the marble steps and along the corridor to the Emperor's study. We realized our idealized vision of Russia 
with its Tsar father and loyal people, no longer existed. The future of not only the Russian Empire, but the entire world, now depended on the outcome of the imminent battle between the new Russian Tsar and the elements of negation and destruction. Alexander II had given his country freedoms it had been demanding for centuries. But it turned out he had also unleashed a dangerous new force. Revolution.